Reed. I'm the education consultant for the Anchorage Symphony and the principal keyboard player. And it's my great pleasure to talk with you about the November 6th programming for the Anchorage Symphony Orchestra, our second concert of our season as we're emerging from the silence of COVID and hopefully even more healthy times lie ahead. We have an incredible program ahead. And um, first off on the concert is a work by a neglected voice in music history who deserves greatly to be heard much more. And his name is Ballon, Joseph Ballon. And he is the first known classical composer of African descent. He was friends with Mozart. So that gives you a little bit of um, a window, a frame on when he was alive. He was, um, his mother was a slave and his father was a plantation owner on a French colony, an island called Guadalupe. The Nanon, his mom was um, acknowledged to be the most beautiful woman in the French West Indies. His dad, well, many plantation owners would disavow their mistresses and illegitimate children, but George Ballone did not. And when the boy was seven years old, he took Nanon and his son Joseph to Paris due to the harsh restrictions on people of color in the colonies, black people specifically. They still had to register on arrival um, his uh, Nanon and his son as black persons in Paris. Well, there, the dad also then took care of his boy and provided an excellent education and the privileges of an upper class upbringing. It didn't harm things that the boy turned into an incredibly handsome, charismatic man, but there were, and gifted, but there was an undercurrent of racism that um, dragged his life throughout and certainly afterwards. He went to a prestigious school where he studied academics in the morning and then focused on fencing and swordsmanship in the afternoons. And he became the best swordsman in Europe. And it was said, well, this was very huge in society. So this opened a lot of doors to him because the saying was, if you're not a good swordsman, you need not come to dinner. So his dad gifted him a horse and a carriage for his uh, travels around Paris. And the boy, the teenage boy kept growing and excelling in boxing, ice skating, music, the violin especially. Um, he was a true Renaissance man and he danced and fenced his way into the nobility. He became an officer in the court of Louis the 15th and a knight or earning the title of knight. And he began to compose music and built one of the finest orchestras in Europe. In 1773, Parisians flocked to his concerts. He was a music teacher to Marie Antoinette and it was said by a historian that I discovered that the Hedy who was fired from giving her music lessons because they got too close. But she continued to be his supporter and friend and advocate. And when there was a vacancy as the music director of the Paris Opera, she and the King forwarded his nomination. But it didn't come through because two divas and a dancer wrote a letter saying it would degrade their honor and delicate consciousness conscience if they had to work for a man of mixed race. The king was um, saw what lay ahead, so he did not fill the post because he had been so confident of his nominee. There was money and fame and social standing in Boulogne's life then, but then the French Revolution happened and it changed everything. He sided with the monarchy in the war and there was a legion of black soldiers that was formed and he was appointed a colonel. The novelist Alexander Dumas, his father was educated by Boulogne at this time as a swordsman during the war. And it is said by him and his novel of the Three Musketeers that he based the character of the high spirited Aramis on Boulogne. So reread the book with Boulogne in mind now. He was a hero at the end of the war, but then everything fell apart in France politically and people were being renounced who had been heroes. So sadly, Boulogne became an enemy of the people and was actually imprisoned for over a year and nearly went to the guillotine. But when he was released from prison, he had no more military career, no more music career. So he left for Haiti where he assisted 
with the slaves as there was a rebellion going on at the time and he assisted them. And then he returned to Paris where the chain of race was always pulling him back. Before the revolution, his dad had gone back to the plantation on Guadalupe. And when he died, he left everything he had to his white daughter. So um, at this point, then Boulogne was completely penniless. He experienced a series of um, ailments and infections as he was trying to start up a new orchestra. And he died of gangrene, poor, alone, and just 53 years old. His music was forgotten but is being rediscovered now, gems of the period. But sadly, much of his music was lost due to systemic racism and neglect historically. He was friends with Mozart. He lived, they lived together in Paris in an apartment for two months together after Mozart's mother died. And one can only imagine the kinds of interactions they had playing music, talking about music, going to music together. It's, it's incredible. Racial prejudice played an important role in the long-term fate of his works. And this Renaissance man has been denied the history that should have acknowledged him. What we are going to be playing is um, a work that's part of a comic opera that he wrote called The Anonymous Lover. He wrote six comic operas, but this is the only one that survives. And the first performance in the United States happened in 2016 in New York. And then in 2020, the LA Opera Company presented it. It was based on a play by a friend and colleague of his, a female writer whose name was Felicité de Genlis, and they had met as teenagers. The story revolves around a love triangle with a twist. Leontine, who is a young widow who had married as a, as a, a teenager, um, is also very, very close friends with Valcourt for many, many years. And there's an anonymous lover, who's the other portion of this triangle, who is a suitor sending letters and gifts for four years of wooing for Leontine's hand. Well, of course, the anonymous lover turns out to be Valcourt, who found his courage with a little bit of indirect encouragement from Leontine, who began to get wise to what was going on. So the opera ends with a happy wedding and happiness for all. The music is just wonderful, lively, expressive, profound when it needs to be. And um, the overture to the opera, at which he republished as symphony number no. two, it's short, around 10 minutes. It's in three really short sections or movements, fast, slow, fast, typical of the time. And there are just no words needed further to describe it. It's just delightful and beautiful. It's good music, worth hearing, and definitely worth knowing Boulogne's story. So we are excited as a symphony to present this piece to you November 6th. Conlon, James Conlon, who's the music director of LA Opera, I'll close off on, on this segment, but just sharing a couple of thoughts that he had. Some commentators have been moved to see The Anonymous Lover, this opera, as in semi-autobiographical terms, imagining the composer as Valcourt. There are no letters or any evidence about his private life, but it's assumed that he had a very active and more than likely discreet romantic life. It's also no leap to conclude that given his great successes in the highest reaches of society before the revolution, he must have had many female admirers. But this, is, this gives us an occasion um, to reflect that whatever attachments he had or yearned for, all doors were closed to him for marriage because of being a man of color in that society, the social conventions and the laws. And consequently, his life has a tragic dimension personally that we can only imagine. In classical music, we have allowed valuable voices to be forgotten. Denied recognition is one issue and the loss of part of our ancestors' heritage and patrimony to our collectively received culture is another. We should be allowed to hear this music and judge for ourselves as to how we feel about it. Well, I can tell you how I feel about it and how the symphony feels about it. We love Boulogne and are gonna continue loving him now that we know more about him and you should too. Second on the program is a work by Igor Stravinsky who came to fame in 1910 to 1913-ish in Paris 
by writing three of the most amazing ballet scores of all time, um, including Firebird, Petrushka, and The Rite of Spring, which inspired all kinds of shock and rioting and reactions in Paris when they were premiered. In 1920, Stravinsky was living in Switzerland with his family, experiencing financial difficulties post-World War I. And he had had a big quarrel with Diaghilev, who was the impresario of the renowned ballet Russe, which had uh, commissioned those previous masterworks from Stravinsky and worked together to produce. So Diaghilev put together some short, less expensive ballets to help Paris recover a war weary audience hungry for art and the warmth of music and dance. But he wanted to keep the budgets low because money was tight after the war. Anxious to collaborate again with Stravinsky and mend the ill will between them, he was able to get him to meet him in Paris to take a very long, important walk. Diaghilev had gone to a music library in Naples and found a collection of allegedly scores by Pergolesi, a Baroque composer. Stravinsky was reluctant to take on the challenge of a short ballet to arrange this music for the ballet, but he, once he took a look at the scores, he was very intrigued. And the result was a startling throwback to simpler, more graceful harmonies and tunes from two centuries earlier. Pablo Picasso designed the sets and costumes, and there was a wonderful choreographer, and the plot of the opera was based on the Commedia dell'arte traditional comic story of Pulcinella. Pulcinella is very popular with the ladies and is in a lot of trouble with all their boyfriends, like maybe he's going to be murdered kind of trouble. So he finds himself a double who pretends to be killed. Pulcinella is of course safe. The assassins, the boyfriends of all those girlfriends, visit the girlfriends, each of them disguised as Pulcinella. Then Pulcinella, as if risen from the dead, appears. And because he is magnanimous, he arranges marriages for all of the couples and then himself marries Pimpinella. So you get the gist of the comic story. The ballet shocked Paris yet again in a totally new way. What was this with this new music that's like so more, much more elegant and simple and has more tunes and it's definitely modern but has all of these other kinds of things going on from the earlier scores. And Stravinsky, whose music had gone really deeply in a different direction before the war, it's a radical shift and the birth of what became known as the neoclassic movement. And this was a landmark work in Stravinsky's life because for the next 30 years, he said he had his own love affair with neoclassicism and this new mode of writing. By looking backward, he said, I moved forward. It's a totally ingenious use of the scores with a new voice with modern harmonies from the Baroque, from the new music of Stravinsky going on to the Baroque music, splendid orchestral colors and fresh treatment of the melodies, including little bits of new things added in. The ballet premiered in 1920, and in 1922, ever savvy about the financial advantages of more opportunities to have his music hear heard, he arranged a concert suite of eight movements from the 20 sections of the original 40-minute ballet. And what's fun for historians to have discovered is that only three of the movements are actually Pergolesi's music. He died at the age of 26 and he was very famous and there were no copyright laws at that time. So lesser known composers would use his name to boost their own sales on their own music. And that is some of the music that has been involved with this piece. Diaghilev hadn't expected anything but an arrangement of Pergolesi scores, a stylish orchestration. And Stravinsky relayed, my new music so shocked him that he went about for a long time with a look that suggested the offended 18th century. But there were lots of positive reviews and a fun description by English conductor Constant Lambert in which he said, Stravinsky was like a child delighted by a book of 18th century engravings, yet having no twinges of conscience about reddening the noses 
or adding beards with thick black pencil for love and joy. You're seeing the 18th century through a 20th century lens. Stravinsky said this was again, the first of many years of love for a new direction. And his new direction, his innovation impacted all modern composers and began a wondrous chapter in 20th century music. Cannot wait to hear the Anchorage Symphony play this. So after the intermission, Mozart, and I thought in honor of a lot of good years of fun with a, a lovely little book that I've always enjoyed using at pre-concert chats, Bach, Beethoven and the Boys, Music History as it Ought to be Taught, the opening several paragraphs about Mozart's life. Mozart is jo just God's way of making the rest of us feel insignificant. Whenever you have just composed a piece of music you think is particularly good, it is humbling to think that Mozart probably wrote a better one when he was nine years old. Little Wolfgang did not start out being particularly remarkable. In fact, for the first three years, he was quite ordinary. He wet his pants, played with his food, and slobbered on his shirt front, just the same as any other small child. Until he was nearly four, he was a complete slacker. He didn't compose a note of music and hardly played the harpsichord at all. By age five, though, he rolled up his shirt sleeves and went to serious work, becoming whiz at the keyboard and composing pieces. At age nine, he wrote his first choral work, which is now in the British Museum. He waited till he was 12 to compose his first opera. From then on, there was no stopping him. In his life of 36 years, he composed 41 symphonies, 24 string quintets, and many, many, many other kinds of music. Why was he such an overachiever? Blame his father as much as anyone, because Leopold was a nag, always bugging him to work hard and make money and not hang around other musicians. Mozart wasn't interested in hard work. He just wanted to have fun. No doubt he was compulsive. When he was learning mathematics, he would fill the whole room with numbers written with a piece of chalk on the walls. His obsessive drive had its roots in the constant concert tours he gave as a small boy. And he was a performing prodigy to noble courts and big cities in Europe. On a visit to the French royal court, here's another connection to Marie Antoinette. He proposed marriage to Marie Antoinette. She turned him down. She was already married to Louis XV. So let's talk just a bit about this symphony. In popular culture, a lot of people, what they know about Mozart comes from the play and the film Amadeus, which is loosely based on historical fact, but very loosely. Um, it's astonishing to know that as a real fact, one fourth of Mozart's symphonies were written in two years between 1772 and 1774. Number 29, the symphony that our orchestra is playing was written in 1774. Mozart was 18 years old. I can barely grasp this. 29 symphonies, 18 years old. And this symphony is the most fully mature and the masterpiece of this early period of his symphonic writing. And you will see why if you've never heard it before. If you've heard it, you're gonna welcome back a really wonderful friend. It's charming and elegant and tuneful, beautifully orchestrated, amazing the colors he gets and the effects are glorious. He was so proud of the score still after he had moved to Vienna that he wrote his father to send it back to him so that he could have it performed in the big city. There are four movements. The first has a catchy tune with an octave drop and pulsing rhythms. Then the andante is delicate with muted swings, uh, strings and colors and atmospheres from his little band. The minuet is aggressive, not very dance-like and much more symphonic than minuets of the time. And the Allegro is in the hunting call style that Haydn had so deeply influenced. So we uh, have a joyful, elegant, charming, also profoundly moving and expressive evening ahead for us. And I wanted to close off with a thought about Mozart from David Barber's book again, Bach, Beethoven and the Boys. Mozart, he was short, about five feet, four inches, unattractive, abusive, temperamental, and irresponsible. But he was a genius who wrote heart cramping music that continues to be admired centuries after his death. It just goes to show that politeness isn't everything. 
well, charm is, and we have lots of it and lots of joy ahead on November the 6th. So for our Anchorage Symphony, symphonying on as we are still maneuvering COVID, whether you can join us live in the socially distanced hall or are gonna live stream with this, please enjoy the music. And we much appreciate your support of the orchestra as we progress these coming months. Lots of music to come. Thank you.